You're listening to The Profile. Hi, welcome to The Profile podcast. I'm Andy Peck. For the past 17 years, I've been interviewing Christian leaders in the church and charity worlds and in the wider culture. It was John Maxwell who famously said, leadership is influence. It's our prayer that these conversations will help you in whatever spheres you have influence for God, whether in the home, at church, in your workplace or elsewhere. The show is brought to you by Premier Christianity magazine, the UK's leading Christian magazine. Get full online access and the print magazine every month by becoming a subscriber. See special offers available now at premierchristianity.com. Every now and again, we like to replay a popular show from the archive. And this week we have one from May 2022, where I speak to the Speak Life founder, Glenn Scrivener, about his book, The Air We Breathe. The book suggests that many of the values that Western civilization holds dear are founded upon Christianity. Glenn is a delightful guest, so trust you enjoy the listen. You may have heard the story of two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys how's the water and the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes what the heck is water the story is sometimes told to show that the culture in the uk or many western nations is anti-god and most people are barely aware of it well my guest today glenn scrivener has written a book to suggest that many ideas that are taken as read in our culture actually depend upon christianity and yet most non-believers, and indeed believers too, are unaware of it. His book is The Air We Breathe, and it looks at how notions such as equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress all have strong foundations in ideas that emanate from a biblical worldview. So when it comes to explaining their faith and speaking in the public square, maybe Christians in leadership can be a little bit more confident than they have been. And if the tide has gone out with regards to faith in the UK, maybe it's on the way back in. So, Glenn, great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for the book. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, A little of your own background, perhaps, before we get into the material in the book, your your journey to faith and to ministry in the UK. Sure. I grew up in Australia, uh, in Canberra, uh, which not very many people admit to. They usually say south of Sydney, but uh, I grew up in Canberra and then age 15, I moved to Wales and then Oxford and then Sydney and then London and then Sydney and then Canberra and then London. And now I'm in Eastbourne. So give or take uh, the odd deportation. I've mainly been in the UK for the last 20 years. I uh, am an Anglican clergyman. I am married to Emma. We've got uh, Ruby and JJ are seven and four. And uh, although I am ordained in the, in the Anglican church, I uh, have a day job working for Speak Life, which is uh, an evangelistic ministry that frees me up to speak at lots of different churches or schools or universities uh, to make media online, uh, to write a little bit and to train others in doing the same. So we've got an internship program at Speak Life, where people can sort of come on the road with us and make media with us and be trained in theology and, and, uh, and mission. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of me. Fabulous. And presumably there's some British connection in your family history in that? No? What, what, no. Brought, you to, what brought you to the UK? My dad got a job and okay. we just switched hemispheres with, well. with not very much notice. And okay. so, yeah, I, I wasn't yet 15 years old. And I, I kind of found myself in South Wales, going from old South Wales to New, uh, New South Wales to old South Wales. Well. And uh, yeah, and uh, I've, uh, married, I've married a Northern Irish girl. So that's, that's a lot of it, you know. So she's, she thinks that Eastbourne is about halfway between Belfast and Sydney. But uh, that, that goes to show my powers of negotiation. <laughs> well done. Um, and and speak life. Uh, some people may have seen your some of the YouTube clips, some of your kind of raps uh, around Christmas time and other times of the year. Yeah, that's a bit of fun. So I, I kind of started doing some videos when I started working for Speak Life, and they started doing well. And so I did a few more videos. And so a, a lot of what we do is actually um, sort of media based, and a lot of what we train the interns to do as well is kind of filmmaking. And and I I've got a real passion for creativity in outreach because I think we capture imaginations 
as mu- as much as we capture minds and i and i do think that the the job of mission of preaching of evangelism is to immerse people in the strange new world of the bible and show them around show them christ in all his technicolor glory and so it's it's not simply a kind of a didactic teaching people you know certain intellectual truths it is really immersing people in the way of jesus and uh, using creativity is i think at, at the heart of our mission well that imagination idea obviously takes us very much into the book that you've, you've written. Um, I mentioned the themes in the book in my introduction, equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. Um, uh, we have not have time, of course, to look at each uh, chapter in our time. But I just wonder if, uh, to illustrate the kind of approach in the book, you could maybe take one of these and uh, sort of mm-hmm. unpack the way in which you, you see that what uh, perhaps quotes the world might think as, being part of its own zeitgeist actually has its origins in the faith. Yeah. So there were seven, seven values because it had to be, because it's about Christianity. So you, you had to, you had to go with seven and, uh, and I kind of go through seven different epochs in history. I've got old Testament, new Testament, early church, middle ages, the scientific revolution, the abolition of the slave trade, and then on into the modern world. And I map those roughly onto these seven values. And perhaps the first one is as good as, as any to sort of demonstrate the difference that the Jesus revolution has made. Because the ancient world is a world that absolutely assumed inequality. That's the most obvious thing. You know, you talk to Plato, sort of the founder of Western philosophy, the old Greek dead, he's, he's dead now, Plato, but uh, very influential. And one of, the, one of the greatest thinkers in the history of humanity. And he would say, does not nature teach you that it is right for some to have more and some to have less. Does that, does not nature teach you that it is right for some to rule and some to be ruled over? And those who we rule over, Plato called living tools or slaves. And he thought that the most natural thing to see in the world, if you, if you have two people, you, um, you might measure them according to any one metric. And what you will discover is that one of them is stronger than the other. And one of them is more intelligent than the other. One of them is more economically productive. One of them is from a higher class than the other. What you see is inequality. Now, nowadays, we look at people and one of the most fundamental beliefs we have is that there is a profound and inviolable moral equality of every single individual. And it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your religion, it doesn't matter where you are, whatever you were born with, you are equal. And Plato would just say, equal how? What are you talking, what nonsense you're talking about? Um, And fascinatingly, I I think Plato would see our view of equality the way most of my non-Christian friends sees my view of God as a lovely, magical, made-up idea that seems to make me happy. Equality is not something that you can derive scientifically. It's not something that you can derive logically or philosophically. It is a real faith position, and it has come to us uniquely and specifically through the Bible. On page one, you have humanity made male and female in the image of God, made not to be slaves of the God, but made to have dominion over the earth. And you keep the story going, and and suddenly God the Son at Christmas time, takes flesh and becomes human and gives the most incredible worth to humanity. And of course, the kind of human he becomes is someone who is at the bottom of the pile and someone who goes on to die the slave's death at the bottom of the the Roman ladder of glory. There he is at rock bottom. And Christians say, oh no, that's God. God has plumbed the pit and risen again to his palace to invite us all into his royal family where no one is a Lord except Christ and all of us are brothers and sisters. And as that message has absolutely revolutionized first the church and then through the church out into culture, it has made us see people as equals. This view is not a natural view. It is a supernatural view and it has come to us through the Jesus revolution. Well, that's uh, terrific to, to hear you outline that in, in that kind of fashion. Uh, what kind of gave you the inspiration for the book? What, what Was it something that you were thinking through yourself and you thought, hey, I've got a book here? Very much so. I, I think about 
Oh gosh, in 2011, I read Vishal Mangalwadi's book, uh, which is called The Book That Made Your World. And he is a, um, an Indian philosopher who was looking at Western civilizations and, and seeing, well, okay, there's, the, there's an economic prosperity here and there's a sort of a liberal democracy that's going on. What has produced this? And he comes to the conclusion that, well, the Bible has produced this. And that set me off on the train of really um, lapping up these these kinds of books. And uh, David Bentley Hart wrote a book called Atheist Delusions, The Christian Revolution and Its Fashionable en Enemies. Um, and who else? There was uh, Larry Seidentop was a, a philosopher who kind of thought to himself, where have we got the idea that we're individuals who are all equal before the law? All ancient societies have thought of us as just members of a collective um, where, do, where do we get this idea of the individual? So he wrote the book, Inventing the Individual. And again, it's the Jesus revolution that, that, it's the heart, uh, that is at the heart of it. Um, Tom Holland in 2019 came out with a big book called Dominion. And uh, he's gone on a journey himself as he's sort of investigating where our modern Western values have come from. He has recognized they are not natural, obvious, or universal. They've come to us through Christian history. And that's taken him on his own sort of spiritual journey. And so I, I just found that fascinating. And in my own evangelism, I've just come to see how very um, fruitful it is to point out that my non-Christian friends are believers. <laughs> They yes. too have beliefs yeah, and yeah. those beliefs have come to them through Christianity. I think it, I think it gives you a, a, real, a real way in, in conversations. Sure. Sure. Uh, and as you were researching the book, Gren, um, were there any particular things you, that surprised you or intrigued you that you thought, well, uh, you know, that I hadn't realized that. So many things, so many things. Um, uh, on a negative um, Point. I, I think the anti-Semitism in the church and historic examples of anti-Semitism are sort of horrifying and blood chilling, really. Um, when you when you see some of the, the the horrors that the church has inflicted on on Jews uh, down through the years, that 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 has that had rocked me and has rocked me. Um, on the positive point, I think. Um, Kyle Harper's book, um, From Shame to Sin, is a fascinating book about the sexual revolution of the first century. When we hear the words, the sexual revolution, we usually think the 1960s. And he says, well, no, no, 1900 years before the summer of love, there was the most incredible revolution that equalized the sexes because Jesus came along and he told a whole bunch of, of red-blooded males that they need to settle down and get married and have kids. And if not, then it's chaste singleness from then on. And it was a real equalization of the sexes because now men were required to be as restricted as women always had been expected to be. And it has birthed the modern world. And I think through Kyle Harper's book and through another book um, by uh, Joseph Henrik called uh, The Weirdest People in the World, he, um, again, not a Christian, but uh, just coming to see what is it that has shaped the modern world? It has been the weird views of Christians. And by weird, he, um, he uses the acronym W-E-I-R-D, Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, Democratic. Those societies are very different to other societies around the world and down through history. And the difference is Christianity. At, at a scholarly level, nobody doubts that. The difference as to why we, uh, our culture has evolved the way that it's evolved is definitely through Christian history. Joseph Henrik says it's, it's been through the sexual revolution of the first century. It's through the marriage and family program that Jesus launched onto the world. And just what a, an incredible force for good the Christian sexual ethic really is. And I, I try to get that across in my uh, chapter entitled Consent. Yeah, absolutely. I was fascinated to see the way in which the f the family ideas and the way in which that the powerful um, shouldn't necessarily just have all the women kind of thing had a had a knock on effect upon society in a massive way. I mean, Joseph Henrik's book it's a it's a big fat one, but he he writes really brilliantly. He's uh, he's kind of an evolutionary psychologist and, and sociologist. Um, so I, I yeah, it, it, that that really opened my eyes. I, I always knew from a theological point of view, I think um, the goodness of Jesus' sexual ethic. But I I think when you see historians like Kyle Harper or or you see kind of sociologists like Joseph Henrik saying, oh no, really, um, this is this single handedly 
has uh, you know accounted for so much of the prosperity and the equality and, and all the other values that we love today um, it's given me a fresh appreciation for the wisdom of jesus so glenn we're talking at the time when council culture supposedly has silenced christians at least that's the belief um christians are often sp- afraid to speak life because they feel like the world is judging them and sometimes judging that the faith that they perceive the world thinks of uh, as being Christian. And so mm-hmm. they keep kind of quiet. And your book, I hope, will um, help to loosen the tongues to some extent of, uh, of, of, of Christians and feel a bit more confident. But do you sense that cancel culture is doing its work or do you think Christians were frankly, always fairly quiet about their faith. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, well put. I, th- I think we censor ourselves far more than anyone censors us. I mean, how many, how many times have you actually been censored? And how many times do you actually censor yourself? You censor yourself like multiple times each hour. Um, so before we sort of start to worry about council culture out there, I think we need to worry about our own cowardice I think we need to as well recognize that it's Christians who invented cancel culture just because Christians invented everything. Um, (laughs) Unfortunately, we've exported cancel culture as well, which is just a sublimated way of carrying on theological disputes. Um, Instead of excommunicating people now, we cancel them, right? But it's still, we still (laughs) denounce them as heretics and blasphemers and and it's our fault, right? It it is, but I think that's because human beings really do have a sense of righteousness and we do have a sense of mission and calling and we're all evangelists actually which is why we're always trying to you know correct the views of other people and and police their thought um but i i i hope that this book um gives you a little tactic when you when you feel like somebody is objecting to you because of your christian beliefs here's the tactic you should use start to think okay as they make their critique of the church where are they standing because they are not standing on neutral ground and they are not actually outside of the Jesus revolution looking in. They are like goldfish in the bowl (laughs) objecting to the water. So what is it that they are, what is it that they are assuming about Christianity in order to critique Christianity? And you'll find any number of answers to that question. If for instance, um, your non-Christian friend finds it abhorrent the way that, you know, Christians treat minorities, let's say, um, well, where do we get the idea that you should lift up and protect minorities? You, on, you honestly get it from Jesus. You, you, you do not get it from nature that is red in tooth and claw. Um, if, if people want to object to Christianity being backwards, well, where do you get the idea that we should be progressive? Where, where, where historically has the idea of progress come from? If people say that Christianity is anti-science, well, where do you get the idea? Where does science come from, Right. Um, if Christianity, you know, is said to be, you know, it's, it's so fascinating when you think of any of a shopping list of objections people make to Christianity, they say it's unequal, it's cruel, it's coercive, it's unenlightened, it's anti-science, it's anti-freedom, it's regressive, <laughs> it's anti-progress. And what have I just done? I've just reversed the seven values yes, yes. Of, of the air we breathe. And so hopefully it gives you a little bit of a tactic that, that actually the, um, the energy that is coming from your non-Christian, you know, interlocutor is, is actually religiously charged or religiously motivated. And the criteria by which they are judging Christianity has itself come from Christianity and, and pointing that out, pointing that out can be very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Glenn, Tom Wright reflecting on all this was talking about the, the challenge in our world of, of uh, sound bites and the fact that we don't, have time really to discuss some of these issues obviously to some extent your book is is presuming that people are thinking wisely and sensibly and in in straight lines about life and not just coming out with sign bags. yes well and it just means you you need to buy my book and spend time <laughs> reading, reading, reading through the entire argument because he's right it's, it's it's very difficult to and and it can sound like we're having a great conversation and you know you're on board with what i'm saying i'm on board with what you're saying and we we let each other finish our sentences um so often that's not what it's like in in normal conversation and it can be really hard and i, I don't want to give the impression that all you need to do 
is just you know reel off um, you know one of these lines like I'm I'm giving here. Um, it's got to be in the context of a much longer conversation and a relationship. Mm. And if you wanted to buy them a copy of the Air We Breathe and just you know <laughs> let them let them sit with the argument for a bit longer, then that that's all to the good as well. Sure. Um, obviously, this has got great implications, Glenn, for uh, for those who are listening to this who are you know, regularly preaching and teaching. Um, mm. Perhaps too often, uh, preachers have presumed that the need to be inappropriately apologetic in the sense that they need, you know, that they're assuming hostility when actually, as you say in the book, you can be a little bit more positive about the approach. Uh, how do you hope the book might help preachers? Jesus is good. Christianity is good. It has absolutely built the world from the ground up. And when you are proclaiming Jesus to a lost world, you are, you are proclaiming the one rock on which we can build in the storms of life when everything else is sinking sand. It is good. That's one thing I would say. Another thing is everybody is a believer. And like, if you want to preach evangelistically, for instance, I, I think we need to stop thinking in terms of, ah, oh, there'll be unbelievers here and there'll be believers here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a doubter about all sorts of stuff. Depends what I'm, depends my mood, depends what day of the week it is, depends my blood sugar levels. It also depends what I'm being asked to, to believe or to doubt. And when you're speaking to a room, you're speaking to a room of believers and doubters, no matter whether it's full of Christians or full of non-Christians, they are believers and doubters, all of them, all jumbled up in the same person. And so I would ad address their doubts with a stronger, more confident um, conviction about who Jesus is and about the wonderful kingdom that he is building. And, and I would point out that the secular person is not as secular as they think they are. They are not as doubting as they think they are. They are believing in all sorts of values and in, they have deep moral assumptions and intuitions that they are navigating their life by, but they have no, they have no ground for it. You know, I, I think one, one of the real dangers is we, we think in terms of um, trying to get people to make a leap of faith, you know, like Indiana Jones has to cross the chasm and believe that there's this invisible sort of bridge that uh, crosses over. And he takes this incredible leap. And I think non-Christians think that, you know, Christians are the Ind Indiana Joneses of spirituality. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing, but you've got to close your eyes and take a, take a leap. And that's just not how life works. We all are already six miles high. We're at 30,000 feet living according to equality and compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. We're, we're already believing things that have no grounding in reason and logic and evidence. Um, we take all sorts of things on faith all the time. And what you're doing when you're preaching is you're not saying to people, leap. You're saying, you need some ground beneath your feet. And, and only Jesus will do. And let me, let me paint him to you in biblical colors and, and see, therefore, you can press into some of your dearest intuitions, like that compassion is what makes the world go round. Ah, no, that's true. Love really does make the world go round, but only if Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is not Lord, none of that works. You're, you're in a castle in the air. But as you preach Jesus, you're, you're preaching to people, not simply to add another absurdity to their list of beliefs, but to ground everything else, all their other beliefs that would be absurd without Jesus. In some ways, what you're saying, Glenn, is that you need to remember Genesis 1 comes before Genesis 3. So uh -huh. too often preachers presume, presume the fall, but they forget that they're talking to image bearers, first of all, yeah. who are still image bearers, albeit right. you know, we're all tainted by sin in that sense. Right. Yeah, no, I like that, yeah. Um, so, Glenn, how could people get a copy and how can they connect with your kind of work? You mentioned your, uh, you have this internship as well, so there may be people in, who want to engage in that and the kind of things that you're doing. Yeah, so there's all sorts of ways you can engage with Speak Life. You can go to speaklife.org.uk. Our internship program, some might want to come to Eastbourne for 10 months. If you can spare that, we'd love to, we'd love to have you. And uh, we do some training together, learn some filmmaking together, and... Um, and do mission together. So come to the, uh, the Speak Life Foundry. We do all, all sorts of other training online that people can do um, at a distance. And we produce all sorts of videos. We've got daily videos, we've got weekly videos, we've got these seasonal videos that you've, you've spoken about. So uh, yeah, lots more to catch up with at speaklife.org.uk. And, and the kind of mission you do, just so people um, have a, a kind of feel to, for the kind of yeah. approach you take, are you, are you, you're a kind of sketchboard kind of evangelist or are you 
a university mission type evangelist or a bit of both or other things? Two main things I do is one is Christian uni unions um, invite me onto their campuses uh, at universities and I'll, I'll do a week long of missions there. I'll do some lunchtime talks and some evening talks. Um, that's one kind of thing I do. Or churches either individually or they club together in a particular locality and we put on again a whole bunch of events, um, usually culminating in some evening events uh, where I speak and, and we use some of this multimedia stuff as well. So that's that's some of the the mission stuff that I do, and then there's the training, um, and and then there's the um, uh, yeah the video stuff. Sometimes when people think about doing evangelism, they have to be uh, a particular type of person. What would you like to say about that? That's what I love about creative evangelism because um, there are some people who are really comfortable in front of the camera and some people um, who very much want to be behind the camera. Um, there are some people who want to just get in a corner and um, do some sketches and, and other people make music and other people um, are more writers and want to develop their craft in that. Um, and it would be, it would be terrible if everybody was like me, it would just be exhausting <laughs> for, if only extroverts were evangelists. Well, I guess we'd only kind of, we'd only engage those others who are extroverts, but it takes absolutely all sorts from the people of God to reach all sorts out there in the world. So uh, whatever your personality type, you are very welcome. Well, thank you, Glenn, so much for, for all that you shared. Uh, the book again is uh, The Air We Breathe, uh, Glenn Scrivener, uh, S-C-R-I-V-E-N-E-R, -E -E and it's published by The Good Book Company. Thank you very much again for your time. Thank you so much, Andy. That was my conversation with Glenn Scrivener of Speak Life and his book, The Air We Breathe. Every now and again, a book comes along with a new and fresh perspective. And you'll have gathered from our conversation, this is that kind of book. So why not get a copy? I promise I'm not being paid any commission for saying this. I was impressed with Glenn's view that we often cancel ourselves every day in failing to speak of our faith. I can only speak personally, of course, but often I'm too timid and fearful and fail to share the most wonderful news we've ever heard. So may this encourage us all to take every opportunity we have uh, to share something of God's love with those around us. So may you know fresh grace in the week ahead, wherever you are placed, and who knows what God may do as we're faithful to him. This is Andy Peck, thanking you for your company and looking forward to next time. You've been listening to The Profile in association with Premier Christianity magazine.